bill and he will sign it right away. We should not delay. It is time to act. I urge my colleagues to vote yes tonight for cloture so we can pass this bill without delay. Let's take this step to begin rebuilding the trust necessary in Congress. Thank you. Mr. President. From Montana. Mr. President, first of all, I'd ask unanimous consent that Val Molzahn, a fellow in my office, be given privileges on the floor for today. Without objection. Mr. President, this afternoon the Senate will have an opportunity to consider banning insider training by members of Congress and their staffs. Now, insider trading is illegal for everyone in America, and there's no doubt about that. But when it comes to the information that folks in Congress learn before the general public learns it, there are no clear-cut rules, and that's unacceptable. Folks in Congress clearly have an advanced knowledge of which bills and issues Congress will consider. They know how those bills will affect basic goods and services. And often the legislation we pass impacts how well a company does on the stock market. Good men and women work for Congress, and I have the deepest respect for my colleagues. I would say all come to the Senate with good intentions to carry out their daily responsibilities without thinking about using information that they learn for personal financial gain. And that's why banning insider trading should be an easy lift. The fact that members of Congress and their staffs are allowed to buy and sell stocks based on privileged information is incredible to me. Congress has historically low approval ratings from the American people. They believe many in Congress don't represent them and have forgotten what it means to be a normal American. Most folks would assume that congressmen and senators already can't trade stocks based on information that they get in their jobs, but it turns out that this may not be true. And that's just one more example of why the American people have lost faith in this institution. As elected officials, it is our duty to regain the trust of the American people. We have an obligation to be as transparent and as accountable as possible. That's why I was the first member of Congress to post my public schedule online for everybody to see. My constituents can look at my schedule every day to see who I meet with and which hearings I attend. Now we have the opportunity to help regain trust in this body by bringing our own rules in line with the rest of America, by adding transparency and accountability. The American people can know that working on their behalf without considering personal financial gains. This bill includes a provision that Senator Begich and I have sponsored to ensure that the annual financial disclosure forms filed by members of Congress are available electronically. As with most transparency, full transparency means the public has the right and the ability to see our records. In the 21st century, there is no reason we can't do it right away. Letting those disclosures sit in a filing cabinet somewhere in a capital complex is not transparency. Putting the files online in a searchable format is. In a time of hyper-partisanship, this is an opportunity for both sides to work together on a bill that we sorely need. There is not a Democratic or a Republican angle to this. Every elected official should want to make sure that the rules we are held to are consistent and transparent. And in line with the rest of the nation. In fact, this is a nonpartisan bill as it can be with ideas from Senator Gillibrand and Senator Brown, carried by Senator Lieberman. This bill covers each section of the political spectrum. It's a straightforward bill that's long overdue, and the Stock Act will be a step towards ensuring that when people run for Congress or come to work for Congress, they're doing so because they want to work on behalf of the American people and not for their own personal benefit. I call on my colleagues from both sides of the aisle to vote yes on this act so we can start restoring faith in Congress. And with that, I yield the floor and suggest I just yield the floor. Senator from Massachusetts. I failed to just reference. I was hopeful that I could have Nathaniel Hoops uh, uh, participate in the uh, legislative process uh, with me on the floor during this debate. Without objection. Thank you. Mr. President, well, Senator from Connecticut. I, I was going to reserve the right to object on Senator Brown's motion because the aforementioned <clears throat> Mr. Hoops, I'm proud to say, got his start on Capitol Hill in my office. And I was just looking for an opportunity to say that. Uh, Mr. President, uh, we have about 20 minutes until the uh, uh, vote on, on, the, on the motion occurs, and uh, obviously 
We're all here together, Senator Collins, Senator Brown, Senator Gillibrand, Senator Tester, and I, to urge members to vote uh, for cloture to take this measure up. It would be a, 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 a ray of light, warm light, if uh, we pass uh, this uh, uh, measure, this cloture vote, overwhelmingly. Um, and then we can go on to debate it. Some people may have amendments, obviously. I presume they will, that they want to offer. Um, I hope that uh, in considering amendments that our, our colleagues will, um, will, will focus on, on the problem that stimulated uh, this legislation, that led us to bring it, led Senator Brown, Senator Gillibrand to introduce it, led our committee to pass it out on a bipartisan vote, which was the concern that uh, members of the Congress and our staffs are not covered by insider trading laws. This uh, legislation makes clear that we are covered by insider trading laws and therefore can be uh, investigated and prosecuted for violation of those laws, both by the SEC and the Justice Department, but we've also asked the uh, ethics committees of both houses of Congress to uh, issue interpretive guidances making clear that insider trading uh, is also a violation of the ethics rules of both chambers. So. Uh, I'm sure that there are a lot of different uh, things that members of Congress, including ourselves, on our committee who worked on this bill might have in mind uh, to also correct uh, problems that exist, uh, perhaps to uh, also try to help to rebuild public confidence in the institution of Congress. But I really appeal to our colleagues uh, not to do so in a way that will make it more difficult, uh, or at worst, impossible, to fix the, the, the wrong, the problem that motivated this legislation, which is the fear that members of Congress and our staffs are not um, covered by uh, insider trading laws. I, I pledge, and I've talked to Senator Collins about this, um, people, have, people have other, members have other ideas. Um, Please introduce them as, as legislation. Uh, to the extent that they're forwarded to our committee, we'll give them hearings and, and uh, due consideration and try to um, uh, approach them thoughtfully and, and, uh, as, and then follow the will of the majority of, of members of our committee. Uh, in other words, l let's not try to make this uh, measure so sweet that uh, it, it uh, or so good that it can't pass. I've just had a I say to my colleagues, a very unusual metaphor come to mind. Um, is I go to Dr. Seuss, and uh, <laughs> this is uh, one of my favorite Dr. Seuss books that I haven't read in a while, Thidwick the Moose. I don't know if you remember Thidwick, but he was a very good-natured moose. And uh, one by one through the uh, pages of the book, uh, as Dr. Seuss records it, he, uh, other animals in the forest uh, want to lodge in his enormous... Um, uh, antlers, and um, he welcomes them until finally uh, it's, there's too much there, and uh, his antlers fall off, and they all fall to the ground. We don't want, we don't want this wonderful bill, <laughs> which really does accomplish some very important things, to be so loaded up that it uh, falls by the wayside, like Thidwick's, Thidwick's antlers. <laughs> and. Uh, and does not uh, pass. So uh, I, I urge my colleagues to uh, join us in a spirited debate, but let's exercise the kind of restraint on a bipartisan basis that will uh, allow us to have a, a significant bipartisan good government accomplishment here at the beginning of this session of Congress. Uh, I, I listened to a conversation a while ago where somebody was asked, why, why is the public opinion of Congress so bad and the answer somebody gave was that uh, it's because Congress has been so bad. Um, this, is, this has not been a, a time in the history of this great institution that uh, I think any of us feel good about. And this is an opportunity to do something real that we can not only feel good about, but more important that our, our constituents can feel good about. So uh, I, I hope that uh, we will have a resounding vote at 530. Uh, I yield to the Senator from Massachusetts. Uh, Mr. President. Senator from Massachusetts. Thank you. Uh, I, I concur, and I've always felt one good deed begets another good deed, and so on and so forth. 
This is a measure that the American people are clamoring for. We need to reestablish the trust with the American people, and this is the first step in doing that very thing. I want to once again thank the uh, chairman for, for referencing something that I failed to reference as well. Uh, we need to make sure, and I would encourage my colleagues on my side of the aisle and my friends on the other side of the aisle to keep all amendments germane, uh, make sure that we move for cloture, get cloture, and then uh, have a free and, and fair and spirited debate on the issues that concern them, but don't get sidetracked to the point where the bill gets killed or pulled. I think that would be a travesty and a mistake. And so I'm going to encourage my colleagues to make sure that if they have a concern, let's air it out and take a full and fair vote on it and move forward. And, uh, <laughs> you know, you. I, uh, I love hearing your stories. Uh, that's why I'm reading your book, all right? And because uh, of your, your knowledge and your history and the way you can weave things just back and forth. And that's a very good analogy. I, too, have concerns. As we've, re as we've referenced many times, that. Uh, there may be forces beyond us who want to make sure that this doesn't come out of committee, uh, sorry, come out of this chamber and go next door and then ultimately be signed by the President. I am not one of them. I want to make sure as you and you and, and many other members, the co-sponsors and such, uh, want to uh, make sure that this bill comes out in, in, a, in a good and fair form. And there, we're here for a very specific reason, to address a very specific issue that affects uh, people, quite frankly, in a manner that I would never thought was possible. Uh, there are other, if there are other concerns, I commend the chairman for publicly stating that let's bring them up in a separate uh, matter, in a separate bill, and address them if there are other things that we've missed, because I have a fear, and I'm hope, I, I hope I'm wrong, that by making it, as you referenced, I think too perfect or too sweet, uh, it, it could fail, and I don't want to see that. I want to make sure that we have a, a very razor-sharp bill, laser-sharp bill, that addresses a very specific issue. And if we do it together and work in that true bipartisan manner, we have an opportunity right now, right now in this moment in, in, our, in our history of this country to do something special. I mean, I was sent here to do the people's business, and I do it each and every day, and work across party lines each and every day with good people and good Democrats like you and others. And I take that role very, very seriously. And we have an opportunity right now to send a very powerful message that the American people are, are yearning for. They want us to do well. They want us to be good. They want us to be better than we've been representing ourselves out to be right now. So I'm encouraging also, uh, just to reference and, and take it a step further, uh, my colleagues to do the same thing. Let's put our party differences aside. Let's put the inner party differences aside and push this thing through in a thoughtful, methodical, respectful, responsible manner that will make the American people say, hmm, wow, okay, it's a good first step. What's next? What's next, Congress? You're going to do the postal bill next? Try to save the postal bill? I hope that's the next thing up. Because we need to work in a truly bipartisan manner. <laughs> Once again, who's here? Senator Lieberman, Sir, Senator Collins, Senator Carper, and, and me, we're, we're pushing to try to save the post office. That should be the next thing. And what's next after that? We need to address our fiscal and financial issues so we can come out of this, this three-year recession in a lean and mean manner to be a, a better country, to be able to compete on a global basis. We need to start putting the American people's interests first instead of everybody else's. So I usually get in trouble when I go off like this, but I think it's critically important to let the people know that, hey, one good deed begets another good deed begets another good deed. And this is the first step, I think, in this new calendar year to do just that. So thank you, and I yield the floor. Uh, thanks, Senator Bryan. I appreciate uh, your comments. I, I just Senator wanted, from Connecticut. Uh, thank you. Thank, thank you, Chair. Um, Mr. President, uh, I'm pleased to report that I just received notice that within the hour, uh, the administration put out the statement of administration policy, the so-called SAP. Uh, strongly uh, endorsing uh, this legislation, S2000 uh, or 2038, and uh, appreciate that uh, very much. It's a, it's a very strong statement uh, of support for the principles and exactly the kinds of things that uh, Senator Collins, Senator Brown, Senator Gillibrand, Senator Tester, and I have been saying here. So, as the, as the President said uh, on um, in the State of the Union speech, uh, this this bill hits. What, what, 
If we can get this bill to his desk, and the sooner the better, uh, he'll sign it as soon as he uh, possibly can. If there are no, no one else who uh, wishes to speak at this time, I would suggest the absence of a quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Acapulco.
Mr. President. The Senator from Connecticut. Uh, Mr. President, I ask unanimous consent that further proceedings under the quorum call be dispensed with. Without objection. The clerk will report the motion to invoke cloture. Cloture motion. We be undersigned senators in accordance with the provisions of Rule 22 of the Standing Rules of the Senate. <laughs> hereby move to bring to a close the debate on the motion to proceed to calendar number 301 as 2038, the Stop Trading on Congressional Knowledge Act, signed by 18 senators. Mr. President, uh, I ask for the yeas and nays. By unanimous consent, the mandatory quorum call has been waived. The question is, is it the sense of the Senate that debate on the motion to proceed to Senate 2038, an original bill to prohibit members of Congress and employees of Congress from using non-public information derived from their official positions for personal benefit and for other purposes shall be brought to a close. The yeas and nays are mandatory under the rule. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka, Mr. Alexander, Ms. Ayotte, Mr. Barrasso, Mr. Baucus, Mr. Begich, Mr. Bennett, Mr. Bingaman, Mr. Blumenthal. Aye. Mr. Blunt. Mr. Bozeman. Mrs. Boxer. Mr. Brown of Massachusetts. Mr. Brown of Ohio. Mr. Burr. Ms. Cantwell. Mr. Cardin. Mr. Carper. Mr. Casey. Mr. Chambliss. Mr. Coates. Mr. Coburn. Mr. Cochran. Ms. Collins. Mr. Conrad. Mr. Coons. Mr. Corker. Mr. Cornyn. Mr. Crapo. Mr. 
Mr. Dement. Mr. Durbin. Mr. Enzi. Mrs. Feinstein. Mr. Franken. Mrs. Gillibrand. Mr. Graham. Mr. Grassley. Mrs. Hagen. Mr. Harkin. Mr. Hatch. Mr. Heller. Mr. Hoban. Mrs. Hutchison, Mr. Inhofe, Mr. Inouye, Mr. Isaacson, Mr. Johans, Mr. Johnson of Wisconsin, Mr. Johnson of South Dakota, Mr. Carey. Mr. Kirk. Ms. Klobuchar. Mr. Cole. Mr. Kyle. Ms. Landrieu. Mr. 
จุลามือจุลีมิสเตอร์ลีมิสเตอร์ลาวินมิสเตอร์ลีเบอร์แมนมิสเตอร์ลูเกอร์มิสเตอร์แมนชินมิสเตอร์มักคีนมิสเตอร์มักคาสกิลมิสเตอร์มักอนมิสเตอร์มินเอนเดสมิสเตอร์มาร์คลีมิสมาคอลสกีมิสเตอร์มารินมิสมาคอลสกีมิสเตอร์มาร์ Mr. Nelson of Nebraska. Mr. Nelson of Florida. Mr. Paul. Mr. Hartman. Mr. Portman, Mr. Pryor, Mr. Reed of Rhode Island, Mr. Reed of Nevada. Mr. Rich, Mr. Roberts, Mr. Rockefeller, Mr. Rubio, Mr. Sanders, Mr. Schumer. Mr. Sessions, Mrs. Shaheen, Mr. 
Mr. Shelby. Ms. Snow. Ms. Stabenow. Mr. Chester. Mr. Thune. Mr. Toomey. <laughs> Mr. Udall of Colorado. Mr. Udall of New Mexico. Mr. Vitter. Mr. Warner. Mr. Webb. Mr. Whitehouse. Mr. Wicker. <laughs> Mr. Wyden. <laughs> Senators voting in the affirmative. Alexander, Ayotte, Begich, Bennett, Bingaman, Blumenthal, Bozeman, Boxer, Brown of Massachusetts, Brown of Ohio, Cantwell, Cardin, Carper, Casey, Coates, Cochran, Collins, Conrad, Coons, Crapo, Dement, Enzi, Feinstein, Franken, Gillibrand, Graham, Grassley, Hagen, Harkin, Heller, Inhoff, Inouye, Johans, Johnson of South Dakota, Klobuchar, Cole, Leahy, Levin, Lieberman, Luger, Manchin, McCain, McCaskill, Moran, Murkowski, Nelson of Nebraska, Hall, Portman, Pryor, Reed of Rhode Island, Risch, Sanders, Shaheen, Stabenow, Tester, Udall of Colorado, Udall of New Mexico, Vitter, Warner, Webb, Wyden. Senators voting in the negative, Burr, Coburn. Mr. Carey, Mr. Carey, aye. Ms. Snow, Ms. Snow, aye. Mrs. Murray, Mrs. Murray, aye. Mr. Roberts, aye. Mr. Roberts, aye. Mr. Rubio, Mr. Rubio, aye. Mr. Lee, Mr. Lee, aye. Mr. Hatch, Mr. Hatch, aye. Mr. Johnson, Mr. Johnson of Wisconsin, aye. Mr. Durbin, Mr. Durbin, aye. Mr. Nelson of Florida, Mr. Nelson of Florida, aye. Mr. Chambliss, Mr. Chambliss, aye.
Mr. Okaka. Mr. Okaka. Aye. Mr. Sessions. Mr. Sessions. Aye. Mr. Shelby. Mr. Shelby. Aye. Mr. Toomey. Mr. Toomey. Aye. Mr. Reed of Nevada. Mr. Reed of Nevada. Aye. Mr. Lautenberg, Mr. Lautenberg, aye. Mr. Baucus. Mr. Baucus, aye. Mr. Merkley, Mr. Merkley, aye. Rockefeller, Mr. Rockefeller, aye. Mr. Cornyn, Mr. Cornyn, aye. Mr. Schumer, Mr. Schumer, aye. Ms. Mikulski, Ms. Mikulski, aye. Mr. Whitehouse, Mr. Whitehouse, aye. Mr. Corker, Mr. Corker, Aye, Mr. Barrasso. Mr. Barrasso. Aye. Mr. Thune. Mr. Thune. Aye. Mr. Hoven. Mr. Hoven. Aye. Mr. McConnell. Mr. McConnell. Aye, Mr. Kyle, Mr. Kyle. Aye.
Mr. Blunt, Mr. Blunt. Aye. Mrs. Hutchison, Mrs. Hutchison. Aye. On this vote, the yeas are 93, the nays are 2. Three-fifths of the senators duly chosen and sworn having voted in the affirmative. The motion is agreed to. Mr. President. Senator from Connecticut. Mr. President, I ask unanimous consent that the Senate proceed to a period of morning business with senators permitted to speak therein for up to 10 minutes each and that Senator Grassley be recognized to speak for up to 20 minutes. Is there objection? No objection. Mr. President, uh, on behalf of the Majority Leader, has asked me to announce that there will be no more votes tonight. Uh, if I may, on my own behalf, say that we'll go, go to the uh, Stock Act S2038 tomorrow morning and I uh, hope anyone who has a relevant amendment will come to the floor and uh, introduce it. I thank the chair. The senator from Iowa. Mr. President, um, I've been, I've been asked. The chamber will be in order. Mr. President, I've been asked by Senator Brown of Ohio if he could be. Excuse me. The Senate will come to order. I'm, I'm willing to wait. Let him, let him talk. Senator from Iowa. Mr. President, I've been asked by Senator Brown of Ohio if he could be recognized immediately after me. Is there objection? Without objection. One week ago today, I addressed the Senate on President Obama's decision to bypass the Senate and the Constitution as well by making four recess appointments at a time when the President's recess appointment did not apply. I explained in detail why the legal memo released by the Obama administration attempting to justify President Obama's actions did not hold legal water. Last Thursday, I laid out the case that this is not an isolated incident or a technical legal squabble. Rather, the President's recent actions are part of a pattern of disregard for the constitutional system of checks and balances. Today, I will address why such criticisms are justified and why such criticisms are necessary. First, is it legitimate for a U.S. Senator to criticize a legal opinion issued by the Office of Legal Counsel and the Senate confirmed head of that office. I have no doubt that senators may criticize such opinions and when the facts warrant, ask whether that office and its head are exercising the independence that is required for the Constitution to be upheld. Now, recently you read some in the media apparently disagree with this. They say that it is wrong for a senator to ever criticize a Senate-confirmed official's independence and judgment. They say that all a senator can do is criticize the official's substantive arguments. I say nonsense. When the media makes these claims, it merely seeks to divert attention from the weakness of the opinion's actual conclusions and reasoning. In my statement last week, I laid out my disagreement with the contents of the Office of Legal Counsel opinion. Of course, senators and administration officials can reach different conclusions 
on the law. Each can have a reasonable point of view, but that is not the case here. If the Office of Legal Counsel is to be, quote, unquote, the constitutional conscience of the administration that some in the media characterize it to be, it must exercise a certain level of independence, as I mentioned in my statement, when a president who takes an expansive view of his power asks the Justice Department officials who owe their job to him whether he has the constitutional or legal action to take action, the authority to take such action, there is always the chance that pressure will overtake their responsibilities to provide their best legal judgment. That is why at Ms. Seitz's confirmation hearing and in a follow-up communications, we took very painstaking effort to give her the opportunity to state on the record her commitment to providing independent legal advice, to make sure that she would place loyalty to the law and loyalty to the Constitution above her loyalty to the President. That was our purpose. Ms. Seitz promised to act independently. She promised not to stand idly by if she thought the Constitution was being violated. Now, the only way to tell whether the office has given independent advice, the only way to tell whether pressure has been resisted, is to review the arguments and the reasoning that the Office of Legal Counsel provides. The media cannot address criticism of whether the head of that office is independent and has used good judgment without such a review. It is not enough that the media might agree with her conclusion. In this case, the analysis in the Office of Legal Counsel opinion was so poor as to raise legitimate questions concerning judgment and independence. Office of Legal Counsel is supposed to give the president objective legal advice before that person acts. It is not supposed to provide a weekly thought out rationalization for a presidential decision to act that has already been made. Here, the argument in the opinions are so weak that a fair-minded person can question the independence and judgment of the opinion's authors. For instance, the opinion is internally inconsistent. It correctly recognizes that a president's ability to make recess appointments turns on the capacity of the Senate to conduct business. But in determining whether the pro forma sessions constitute a recess, the, opi the opinion does not consider at all the capacity of the Senate to conduct business and what it, and what it could do. Rather, it relies upon what individual senators said not what the institution said, said or can do. And it ignores not only what theoretically the capacity of the Senate had to act, but even its actual actions. Similarly, the established meaning of the word recess is the same each time it appears in the Constitution. Given the term the same meaning means that the President can make recess appointments but that this is a limited power. The Office of Legal Opinion, contrary to clearly established precedent, inconsistently defines the term recess differently when it was used in different parts of the Constitution. But you can't do that. The only thing consistent in the opinion is that it interprets recess each time in a way that expands the power of the President to make recess appointments and in such a way as to leave open the question of whether that power is limited in any meaningful way. Former Federal Circuit Judge Michael McConnell, himself a former Justice Department lawyer who has defended presidential power, found the arguments in the Office of Legal Counsel opinion to be so implausible 
those are his words, that, quote, it is difficult to escape the conclusion that the Office of Legal Counsel is simply fashioning rules to reach the outcome that it wishes, end of quote. Since the outcome that the Office of Legal Counsel wishes is to expand presidential power contrary to the text of the Constitution and also many decades of historical practice, it is quite fair to question the independence, the judgment, and the adherence to statements made during the confirmation process by the head of that office. The media, again, focus more on personalities than on substance. And that will say that the Bush administration reached a similar conclusion, so how could Miss Sites be criticized? That's where the media is coming from. Well, there's three points to be made here that sets the record straight for the newspaper. First, President Bush did not make recess appointments when the Senate was in pro forma session. Secondly, President Bush did not even claim that he could make such recess appointments while declining to do so. And third, his Office of Legal Counsel did not issue any opinion that would be binding on future Justice Department advice. Unlike the public actions of the Senate confirmed head of OLC, a lower level official in the previous administration, the Bush administration, apparently wrote a secret memorandum to the file on this subject. Now, the existence of such a memorandum was not known until the Office of Legal Counsel opinion referred to it and sought to rely on it. It is not possible to evaluate the reasoning of, the me of that memorandum because the Department of Justice has not agreed to release it despite my request that they do it, that they do release it. Now, if the Office of Legal Counsel is to exercise the independent judgment that is necessary for it to properly perform its functions, it cannot rely on some sort of secret memo or memos from lower level officials. That approach creates incentives for the Office of Legal Counsel heads to avoid accountability. An incentive is created for the preparation of secret memoranda that make outlandish claims of presidential power if they can't be reviewed by anybody. No one knows of the memo, so its arguments do not face the transparency of public scrutiny. The president and office of legal counsel take no responsibility for its conclusions. Then the office of legal counsel later issues a public opinion on the subject. To, bol to bolster very weak arguments, it cites earlier mammals. But it avoids transparency as well by keeping the memorandum secret so no one can see that the opinion's weak arguments may be supported by only other weak arguments. And it avoids accountability by suggesting that this question was already decided by an earlier Office of Legal Counsel memorandum. Instantly, the number of administrations that support expanded presidential power goes from zero to two, neither one of which is based, is said to be responsible for that expansion. That bootstrapping can never lead to a reasoned, objective analysis of presidential power. It cannot produce the independent OLC that Ms. Seitz promised the Senate that she would provide at her confirmation. The media has also made the strange argument that Mrs. Ms. Seitz's opinion must be professional and her judgment and independence cannot be questioned because of her high professional reputation. Now, isn't that a little bit backward? The legitimacy of the argument contained in the legal opinion is not established by the reputation of the person who wrote it. Reputations are not static. 
They are established by quality, by the quality of the professional work, not the other way around. In the past, a prominent Democratic senator called for a judge to resign because of his legal work as Office of Legal Counsel head. The, the Washington Post, in an earlier editorial, criticized the opinions of other Bush administration OLC lawyers as displaying, quote, the logic of criminal regimes, end of quote. And again, another quote, bringing shame to the American democracy, end of quote. Now, if the Post truly believes that criticizing Office of Legal Counsel lawyers beyond, is beyond the pale, they should retract their earlier opinion and condemn the far harsher rhetoric that was hurled against Bush OLC lawyers. Well, explaining that, what's wrong with the uh, newspapers, I now go to explain why my criticisms were not just legitimate, but they were absolutely necessary. Last Thursday, I laid out in great detail a long series of abuses of executive authority and usurpation of legislative authority by President Obama and his administration. In fact, he made his, his willingness to bypass Congress a campaign issue with slogans like, quote, we can't wait for Congress, end of quote. And those headlines and slogans were splashed all across the White House website. President Obama has made the decision to run for re-election, not on his record, for obvious reasons, but against Congress. In doing so, he's daring Congress to defend its role as the representatives of the Americans from each of the 50 states in face of his unilateral agenda. Some have suggested that this is a clever political trap laid by President Obama, that if Congress resists the President's power grabs, it will validate his slogans and play into his electoral strategy. Now, this may or may not be true. However, the stakes are greater than the next presidential election, and the implications of the President's actions will be felt well beyond any short-term political gain. The framers of the Constitution foresaw the temptation by one branch of government to try to usurp the powers of the other branches. In Federalist 51, James Madison explained how the Constitution was designed to prevent power grabs through an ingenious system of checks and balances. And he wrote this long quote, but the great security against a gradual concentration of several powers in the same department consists in giving to those who administer each department the necessary constitutional means and personal motives to resist encroachment of the others. The provision for defense must in this, as in all other cases, be made commensurate to the danger of attack. Ambition must be made to counteract ambition." End of Madison's quote. Of course, this assumes a desire on the part of each branch to guard its constitutionally granted powers. If some members of Congress are not willing to resist an encroachment because they place party loyalty above constitutional responsibility, or if members are reluctant to push back for fear of political consequences, then the system of checks and balances will not work as it was intended by our Constitution writers. All members of Congress swore an oath to support and defend the Constitution. That is our first obligation. I would like to be clear that this is not an argument about constitutional semantics. It is one of fundamental principle. As Madison explains in Federalist 51, the separation and distinct exercises of the different powers of government is essential to the preservation of liberty. This also goes beyond an argument about the ends to which 
President Obama has used to has used the new powers that he now claims. His agenda is controversial to be sure, or he would not have had to bypass Congress. Still, even those who support this president's policies should not be so quick to look the other way. Once the walls separating the powers allotted to each branch of government are eroded, they're very difficult walls to rebuild. The most eloquent expression of the philosophy on which our nation was founded is, of course, the Declaration of Independence. And so I quote the all-familiar. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. To secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. Based on these fundamental principles, the Constitution laid out a form of government designed to protect individual rights by resisting the concentration of power. This can be frustrating to those who would like a more activist government. Still, these features of our Constitution perform a very important role in preventing one faction of Americans dominating another faction of Americans. I am sure that President Obama is convinced that his agenda is what's best for the country and that the end justifies the means in pursuing that agenda. But that is not the Machiavellian ideas that any of our Constitution writers had. Naturally, he doesn't see any danger in concentrating power in the presidency because he believes that he will use that power very wisely. Moreover, he has gone out of his way to identify himself with a school of thought that the constitutional separation of powers is an outdated barrier to change. Last month, President Obama gave a speech in Kansas in which he sought to link his agenda to Teddy Roosevelt's famous new nationalism speech at the same place in 1910. The original speech marked the beginning of Roosevelt's break with many of his past policies and with the incumbent Republican President William Howard Taft. Roosevelt then went on to challenge Taft in the 1912 election uh, as, a, a, as heading up the Progressive Party ticket, and you know both Roosevelt and Taft lost. In that 1910 speech, which President Obama paid tribute to, Roosevelt described his new nationalism as, quote, impatient of the impotence which springs from the overdivision of governmental power. This philosophy seeks to fundamentally transform the United States from a nation founded on the principle that protecting the unalienable natural rights of each citizen is a paramount goal of government to one that empowers a, an enlightened elite to take whatever action they deem, ne deem necessary to correct perceived wrongs in society. In other words, throw the Constitution out the door. This may start out with very good intentions, but there is no guarantee that once our constitutional protections are gone, future leaders will always act in the most enlightened way. In fact, the single-minded pursuit of a better society at the expense of individual rights has led some of history's led to some of history's worst tyrannies. Moreover, not only is the concentration of power in the executive branch contrary to the founding principles of our nation, it is foreign to the realities of American civic life. With a country as large and as diverse as ours, no individual can claim to speak on behalf of all Americans. Our constitutional system, based on federalism, separation of powers, and checks and balances, helps ensure that each American has the opportunity to live their life as they see fit. So I return to the words of James Madison, quote, it is of great importance 
in a republic not only to guard the society against oppression of its rulers, but to guard one part of society against the injustice of the other part. The voices of all Americans deserve to be heard through the elected representatives of the people. That is what is at stake here. Those of us who were elected to represent the people of our state should do just that or we deserve not to be here. I yield the floor.